Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Welcome, everyone, to episode 50 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I am your host, Jack Rico, and we have come to the halfway mark, the big 5-0, the 50th episode of the show, and it's all really because of you guys. Thank you so much for streaming, playing, downloading the show. Without you guys, we would not be in this position. We're planning on doing another 50 shows because of you guys. We want to send our wishes and our prayers to our Latino brethren over in Mexico and Puerto Rico. It's been great to see how the celebrities have reacted to this. Salma Hayek just raised about $300,000 just uh, in the last few days. Seeing sports athletes and and singers and actors uh, leaving the promotion of albums, the promotion of movies and TV shows to the side to just come together and truly help. I, th- to me, that's the best way to use celebrity. So good to see that happen. On this show, by the way, we have some really good guests. First of all, we're going to be talking Oscar season with Wilson Morales from blackfilm.com. He just recently went over to the Toronto International Film Festival, which is a little sneak peek to what the best pictures at the Oscars might be for 2018. Also, HBO is coming out with a new documentary called Clinica de Migrantes, and it's directed by a Russian named Max Bozdorovkin. We'll talk to him to see what this show is about and why you need to see it. And then we talk to Deborah Castillero, a Latina entrepreneur who developed a Latino app that teaches children to speak Spanish and English. She stops by to discuss the challenges in creating the app and the advantages to having your children learn a second language. So keep your headphones on. This is the Highly Relevant Podcast. It's that time of season again, folks. The Oscar season is upon us. We already had the Emmys. Now it's movie time. The Toronto International Film Festival just wrapped up. The Venice Film Festival just wrapped up. And now it's time for the New York Film Festival. And to kind of give us a recap of all the movies that are uh, going on that are being released this fall, along with some festival news we have with us. One of the best film critics, in my opinion, is Wilson Morales from uh, BlackFilm.com. Hey, man, what's going on, buddy? Not much. You know, it was a long, grueling festival, but that was fun. (laughs) You know, we we are nonstop seeing a lot of films. (laughs) You were at the San Diego Comic Con. I mean, you are literally everywhere, man. Not everywhere, but I try to go where the fun is going to be at. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so let's start immediately with what happened at the Toronto International Film Festival. The reason I begin with that is because, to many, this is the number one film festival in the world, over Cannes, over New York, not in terms of glitz, but in terms of quality of films that will be nominated and probably win Best Picture at the Oscars. What did you see? What captured your attention at TIFF this year? Toronto is a lot of things. One, you get a lot of the movies coming out there that's in contention. I, I kind of call it the Iowa caucus, you know, in terms <laughs> of the films. You know, it's where it's where the gates start. Even though you have festivals prior to that, Toronto, Toronto is actually the most cost-effective festival to go to. You know, people don't got money to go to Venice or Telluride, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, but coming, you know, but a lot of those films go to Toronto because that's where the most of, uh, you know, the Oscar pundits are going to be at. So going out there and seeing a number of films, I think the films that came out looking in good shape was The Shape of Water, mm-hmm. <laughs> ironically. Guillermo del Toro's. You know, that, that did got you a see lot it? of buzz. Yes, it did, you know. And Is it a masterpiece? That, Is it one of his best? It's definitely one of his best, you know. Uh, is it a masterpiece? That I don't know. You know, I don't... You know, I've seen, you know, personally speaking, I've seen other movies that he's done well, but just probably didn't get the either critical or financial attention. Uh, but it is good. You know, it's it's a it's sort of like a companion to Pan's Labyrinth. You know, you know, I felt it was more of a, a, a of a Jean Pierre Junet Amelie sort of, yes. you know, del- delicatessen like in that in in that spirit more than it is Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, well, yeah, it's kind of like a combination of both. When you say Pan's Labyrinth and you add 
uh, Amalie to it, you know, because because of the uh, romance aspect. Yeah, because of the romantic aspect of it, you know, that's a good analogy, you know, a good comparison actually, you know, to to it. So Guillermo's in good shape, you know. I think you know uh, it's whether or not come, I think was it January so forth, enough people. Uh, at least Oscar voters, because you know they tend to be of an older age, will fall for it. Right you know, now, and it's, a, and it's a sci-fi fantasy. You had said to me that there was no real front runner out of TIFF this year, and that was something that almost shocked you. It shocked me when you when you told me this uh, a few hours ago, and I, I just kept on wrapping them around my head. Are we going through one of the worst years of film? Probably so. When you think about, you know, the summer was one of the worst ever, you know, in terms of the quality. And when you look at Toronto, you know, Sundance didn't produce any movies that's going to, you know, that this time last year we were talking about Manchester by the Sea. Birth of a Nation coming out of Sundance. Yeah, Yeah, those two films. And coming out of Toronto, everybody was praising La La Land. It was the front runner. Moonlight. Moonlight, you know, so you had a, and you you also had performances. They were going to get nominated. You know, here you can't find, you know, we're now left with two big festivals, New York Film Festival and AFI, and you can't find a legitimate five yet. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. Now, here, let me go through a couple of movies that have got me all titillated. You know, The Darkest Hour, as I understand, is one of the best. actually Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. Not The Darkest Hour, because there was a previous film with that same title. Okay, so Darkest Hour, which is the Winston Churchill film. Everyone's been talking about this film. You had a chance to see it. Is it Best Picture Contender? It is a Best Picture Contender, because everything Joe Wright's been nominated previously. He did The Atonement. Uh, um, Gary Oldman has had... You know, he plays Winston Churchill with the makeup, with the voice, and it's a it's a big leading role for him. You know, he's obviously given solid work throughout the years as a character actor. You know, so he's right now in terms of actor the front runner. Uh, the film is in line for a lot of nominations, and when you think of just the quality of it, it's right up there with Dunkirk, which I wasn't a fan of. I, I liked the visuals, I liked the concept, but ultimately I, f- I felt that it was hard to follow because it was going through these flashbacks and these timelines, and I couldn't really follow, and I couldn't get into the character, so when they died, I could care less, just because there was no character development, so I thought that that movie uh, you know, had its flaws, and I'm hoping that Darkest Hour isn't necessarily along the same lines. I think I think Dunkirk will score in terms of the technical achievement. Yes, and then absolutely. Uh, it's the same thing. Like when you think about Titanic and how they scored a lot of nominations, and and Cameron got the nominations, but acting film not so much. The difference is with Dunkirk. You know, like you said, not one of those characters really stood out. You know, um, for Dunkirk, I think with Darkest Hour, it's pretty much all about Churchill and uh, you know his stance and you know. So it looks like he's a lock for the best actor. Win at the Oscars. At no, least. not a win. No, not a, not win. a win. Okay, all right. Not a win. You know, not a win. Just best actor. Not because, like I said before, you know, there's no front runner in terms of it's his to lose. You know, he's right. right now number one, but he can easily be overtaken. You know, if the marketing works well for other candidates. Um, was there I'm anything? Also- was there anything else that captured your attention that when you left some of these theaters and you hooked up with a couple of friends over a beer or lunch or whatever that? Everyone was buzzing around a particular film, not necessarily best picture contender, but, you know, at least a quality film coming out of TIFF. I think you have, um, you also have I, Tanya, which features a fantastic performance by Allison Janney in a supporting role. And uh, Wait, what's Margot the name of that Robbie, movie? Icon. I Tanya, which is basically a satire. Oh, I Tanya. Yes. Yeah, okay. Comedic look in a way. Uh, on At the Nancy the, Kerrigan. The Nancy, but it's pretty much I on Tanya Harding. It's on her Tanya status. Harding. Yeah, not so much Nancy, but pretty much, you know, an understanding of who Tanya Harding was. And Margot I mean, it, Robbie is the Tanya Harding character. Yes, you know that that played well. You know, mm. uh, another film that played well was Lady Bird, which is Greta Gerwig's. Direct, uh, director debut and features a fantastic performance by uh, let's see if I'm pronouncing her name right, Cersei Ronan. Cersei, <laughs> yeah, Cersei Ronan. Cersei Ronan, you know, and you know we've all known the quality of work she's delivered from Atonement, 
uh, from, what was it, Brooklyn a couple of years ago. You know, so I think if she's up and running, you know, she's got enough followers and fans that will recognize her previous work that may bode well for her. Now, I heard that uh, there's a movie by the name of Mudbound that has been getting a lot of buzz for potential Oscar nomination. It's an African-American movie. It's done by Netflix. Uh, Did you get a chance to see it? What did you think? I, I did see it. It's a powerful film. You know, Dee Rees is a director that we've known about since Pariah. She also did HBO's Bessie, um, featuring another fantastic performance by Jason Mitchell, who we remember from Straight Outta Compton. You also have a good performance by Garrett Hedlund. You know, he's always been, uh, in a way, topsy-turvy in terms of the the type of films he's done. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously from a Tron to a uh, Billy Lynn's uh, last halftime song. You know, so here, the two of them are really good. They, they both can get nominated if they don't split each other's votes. You also have a, a career-defining performance by Mary J. Blige. Oh, you wow. Know, yes, you know, it's 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 subtle, but it, it makes its mark. And it's, a you know, we've seen her, little by little, getting that sort of material. You know, she played uh, Coretta Scott in a, in a Lifetime film. You know, but here D. Reese gets a lot out of her. You know, so the film has mm. the potential of being a film nomination. So it's a, a good film nomination. Yeah, it's a good film. It'll stand out. Now, is was there any other African American films that are worth talking about? Do you think that might make it all the way to the Oscars? That are that is worthy uh, of of chatter, or do you think that this particular year? It's going to be, you know, more Oscar so white and neutral than it is African American and diverse. Well, you know, the funny thing is the hashtag Oscar so white. I think when initially was started was because there were a lack of nominees for black actors who we deserved should have gotten a nomination, but didn't. Right? Here, should this happen this year? It's not so much because we have actors who should be. It's because we don't have enough for them to be in the running. You know, you can only choose but five. And, you know, we hate, I don't, me personally, wouldn't want to choose somebody because he's black. Choose him because he's good and he deserves to be in there. And because you know? the movie is great. And, yeah. right, as opposed to picking mediocre movies. Look, listen, we, 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 the Latinos have the same issues. We complain and we complain about underrepresentation. But yet, every time we come out with a movie, it's pretty mediocre and average to the point it's like, you know, direct to DVD. How are we going to pick these mediocre average movies into the Oscars and nominate people when the quality just isn't there? So uh, it seems to be like th- that's the same thing going on this particular year, but with the African-American filmmaking community. Yeah? But, uh, well, but, you know, the thing is we shouldn't be waiting until the end of the year to start making these talks. You know, we should be, you know, I guess we don't have enough writers to talk about this throughout the year, through the beginning of the year. People who can see the forecast mm. as far as what's coming out for us to, to say, oh, we don't have enough films in the race. You know, uh, that's the bottom line. You know, just this past week, we look at the Emmy nomination, the, the, you know, the Emmy wins, and you see that, uh, um, what's it called, uh, uh, Donald Glover is only the second black actor to win Best Actor Comedy, only, you know, and how many years the, the Emmys have been around, you know, so it's always about, you know, like Viola said, Viola well, Davidson, when she won her Emmy, we don't get the opportunities. Give us the opportunities and let's see, let people decide for themselves. So it um, seems to me like TV has sucked more of the, the 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 hype and the energy and the talent of what's happening in the uh, in the film universe onto TV, and so that's where they have flocked. It looks like TV a uh, uh, film has been kind of like left in lurch. Uh, besides that, let's go back. You and I had some conversations about the best movies of the year, and we talked about Logan. War for the Planet of the Apes. We talked about Jordan Peele's Get Out, The Big Sick. Are these films still in play come this Oscar season? Those are always tough calls because it's rare for movies that come out that early to stand, you know, to go through nine months and then still make it up. I think the earliest and best film that ever come out so early and do so well was Silence of the Lambs, and that was back nearly over 20 years ago, 1991. But Get Out, even though it came out in February, I mean, I just got an Oscar uh, DVD screener for that. Well, yeah, because, you know, you have a movie that made $175 million. Critically acclaimed, loved by the audience. Yeah, so, but it's a genre, you know? So, Mm -hmm. like, I think, you know, if you stick with 10 nominees for Best Film, 
it can get in there. Um, whether or not it wins, it's a whole different story. Whether or not enough people see it, you know, that vote, you know, um, that's one. Because of the fact that we're having a subpar year, mm -hmm. you may have a year in which you have different genres, you know, be nominated. Remember, Logan's still part of that whole Marvel universe, you know? Right, but that movie played more it like a drama, consider. like like a like a heavy drama, more than it did a superhero film. Yeah, because if you give Logan consideration, do you give Wonder Woman consideration? Oh, come on, no, Wonder it. Woman! There is no way Wonder Woman should even be a part of the Oscar, you know, conversation for this year. It well, was overhyped. It, it, Go ahead. If you if you look at you know, I haven't even looked at the numbers yet, but if you look at probably look at uh, you know what's it called rotten tomatoes who's got the bigger who's got the better score yeah but you know? but the when has the academy looked at rotten tomatoes you know score in order to to figure out if they should pick it for the best picture category look i think it's you know and i said this in in a podcast i was invited to not too long ago i thought that wonder woman is a necessary film but it's not necessarily a great film and I'm going to stick by that. I thought it was an average film that was solid. Uh, it was straightforward. It was direct. It was familiar. But there's no way you can extract one of the best performances of the year by Gal Gadot. There's no way you're picking out anything worthy of Oscar prestige consideration. Remember, now, if The Dark Knight, at it. If the Dark Knight couldn't get into it, why would Wonder Woman? But think about it, I just looked at both of those scores through Rotten Tomatoes, and that's this is these are obviously critics, and they both stand at ninety three percent each, you know, and yet obviously um, Logan made nearly three hundred million dollars, and uh, and uh, Wonder Woman made nearly four hundred million dollars, so they're both equal. But my point and, though, Wilson, is that Logan feels more like a prestige film. It's done dramatically. James Mangle treated that film like it, like 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 it was. Jesus, man, it, it, it was like one one of the great classic dramas of the last ten years. That's the way he treated that. Wonder yeah, Woman was a was was a was a campy, you know, superhero film where it had gags and laughs. And you, you're not going to tell me that that movie was better than Spider Man this year. Yeah, but it's a, it's a question of whether or not this audience, whoever votes and so forth, are going to look at Logan as a standalone without having to see, without having to watch the previous films and say, okay. Who is Logan? Who is Wolverine? Do I need to watch the previous X Men films to get this guy? You know, to get this. You know, because that that's what they're going to look at. They're going to wonder like, why? Why is it just Logan? Why is it just one guy? Do we need to know Hugh Jackson's performances throughout the previous years? Because the reason we're talking about this is because we've seen Hugh Jackman in all of the other Logan appearances. Now. In order to consider Logan by now, if you took those films out of the equation, does Logan stand on its own without I, yeah. recognizing Hugh Jackman? That's a whole different story. If you just look at it as a standing alone and you just say, OK, here's this new actor playing this role, doesn't have the same effect as opposed to like we have seen Hugh Jackman throughout the years. This is his best performance as Logan. Now, let me ask you this. There's 1,500 new members at the Academy Awards this year, a lot of them very diverse. Will we see uh, this diversity influence affect more diversity for the Oscars in terms no, of— No, because we don't have the quality. You know, we don't have the quantity. You may see a film garner some attention, like a Get Out, like a Big Sick, uh, uh, rightly so, Mudbound. But as I look down the road, what do we have coming up left? We don't have enough in, in the bank. What happened to that Denzel Washington film that he plays a lawyer? There was a there was, as soon as we saw the official pictures coming out of uh, the studio, uh, we went, OK, that that movie where he plays a like a quirky offbeat lawyer, that's good. That's best pick and best actor lock right there. Well, I've seen the film. Um, others have seen the film in Toronto. What's the name of it? Uh, it's called Roman J. It's Roman J. Israel Esquire. The title alone is confusing to begin with, <laughs> and, and that itself lends to the film. People have praised Washington's performance, but not the film itself. 
Mm-hmm. And although they made an announcement that it's somewhat like a work in progress, unless they do some editing out, you know, obviously with a month to go before it's released or like in November, you know, there's no way you can go back and do reshoots or anything like that. You're probably just going to have to make it tighter and so forth. Um, it just didn't stick with a lot of people's minds walking out of there saying, oh, hey, Denzel's a shoo We have a few more minutes left. I wanted to ask you about the New York Film Festival. It begins September 28th, October 15th. Opening film is Last Flag Flying. The centerpiece film is Wonderstruck by Todd Haynes uh, with Julianne Moore in the film. Uh, And the end movie is going to be Wonder Wheel by Woody Allen with Kate Winslet. Um, Besides those movies, anything else that you're looking forward to watching at the New York Film Festival that, uh, that, that, that you already have it marked on your calendar? Um, nothing really sticks out to be honest with you. You know, those are the few films that no one has seen yet. You know, so like every other movie that's going to play at the festival has already been screened elsewhere. Um, you know, with Woody Allen, you know, I think you you always you know it's been some years since he actually had a film nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, Midnight it's in more, Paris was the last one. Yeah, it's more about the performance, and this one is obviously a showcase for Kate Winslet, and she's already got two Oscars to her name. I think. Uh, from uh, um, is the ship to Oscars turning, but just one. I'm not well, sure. she was nominated recently for 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 the Steve Jobs movie that they did with Michael Fassbender. Yeah, so she has at least one Oscar to her name. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's going to be more of a performance. And Steve Carell, he's kind of almost everywhere. He's he's got uh, I guess Brad status out right now. He'll have uh, Battle of the Sexes coming out this week, and then he's got you know Last Like Flying. So which performance is the one that stands out? Um, you just never know. And then Todd Haynes, you know, he, he's worked with Julianne Moore before. Um, so we don't know what to expect. Before I before I let you go, um, let's go see if, you know, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot, but let's see what happens. Top 10 Oscar hopefuls so far. You've seen most of the movies. I got 10. Let's see if those match with any of the ones you got. Here I go. Uh, the Greatest Showman, I think, will make it into the top 10 Oscar Best Pick nominees. Star Wars Last Jedi, it just, the setup has been incredible for this Luke Skywalker ending. Uh, Get Out, Shape of Water, which is the Guillermo del Toro film that won the Golden Line at the Venice Film Festival. The Post. Now, no one has talked about this too much. It's Steven Spielberg meets Meryl Streep. He directs Meryl and Streep Tom stars Hanks. and Tom Hanks. And it's sort of like a... In the spirit of All the President's Men, it's a journalism film, uh, a little different than Spotlight, but definitely uh, an attention getter for the Oscars. Battle of the Sexes, which you told me was great. All the Money in the World, I'm also uh, rooting for with Mark Wahlberg. There's a Clint Eastwood movie by the name of The 1517 to Paris, and that's more of a reference to a train and the time the train departs. Uh, There's basically no information on it, but... It's Clean Eastwood, so you have to put it in there. Mudbound, and then Call Me By Your Name that's been getting a lot of buzz. Uh, that has almost like great consensus by all the critics and the people yeah, like, who have watched that it's been a good movie. Like I said before, you know, there's, there's going to be a number of films that uh, you may have a film in which you have a lot of genres in there. You've got Darkest Hour, um, I think, which is, and, and I think Dunkirk is in. I think right now. You think Dunkirk around, will make it, huh? I think Dunkirk will make it, especially top 10. If you're going 10, no, it's No, it. no, no, no. I, I wouldn't even say that. Um, it's funny. Warner Brothers emailed me, and they said, hey, wanted to get your thoughts on Dunkirk and Wonder Woman. What did you think of those two films? And I was honest. I said, the problem, I, I think that Dunkirk's going to be nominated for all the technical awards, but none of, not, 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 not necessarily of the acting awards or the writing awards. Uh, I think Dunkirk will get the nomination along with Christopher Nolan. You know, he's long as overdue a director to get a nomination. Like I said, mm-hmm. we're not talking about a winning just to get the nominations. And then, like I said, you've mentioned three films that have yet to be seen. So like if any of those fall through the cracks, it opens the door wide open to something that we have seen already. That's going to be garnering more votes, you know? So like, if you say, you know, a film like maybe Wonder Woman doesn't get the doesn't doesn't deserve the attention. But if if, you know, Hugh Jackman film doesn't do well or the Spielberg film doesn't do well, you know, then those may stand up. Remember, we talked about Spielberg when he had um, when he had War Horse, when he had the other Tom Hanks film um, recently. 
Oh, a got, Bridge of Spies. Bridge of Spies, you know? And they, they were well-liked and so forth, but, you know, they didn't take home the trophy except for Best Supporting Actor, you know? So so, so you're, you think Dunkirk still has a shot to kind of just squiddle right in? Oh, yeah, if you're, talking, if you're talking 10 films, I think it's it because, you know, it, it's right now, according at least to Golden, Golden Derby, they have it as the, the number one film, you know? So, like, it would be hard to see how that goes number one out of the top ten. So what is the you best know? film of the year so far for you, if you had to pick one right now? If I had to pick one from what I've seen, you know, it's a tough call right now. You know, I, I, I can't say – I wouldn't probably put Get Out as the best film this year, you know. Um, I like Dunkirk. There's, you know, it varies, you know. Like, I haven't seen a true – knockout that's the film to see i i think get out is the best film of the year so far from everything that i've particularly seen it's the one that i left shook it's the one that i felt that i saw something brand new and refreshing and original uh inclusive uh and then just master skill man when it comes to writing and directing it's still part of the horror genre and, you but know, the you Exorcist that, was nominated for an Oscar. The, well, I'm saying like it can get nominated. It can be not. It can get nominated. But it's a question of whether or not you know people who are not who don't necessarily watch that genre will watch it. You know, remember three, four years ago, we all thought Straight Outta Compton was a shoe in to get a nomination, and it didn't get it because not enough people saw it to vote on it. Same thing for like Selma. You know, which lacked a lot of nominations, but Best Picture, you know, you just, it, you know, even though the Academy has added more members, it, we still, I don't know uh, personally what the what the numbers are, you know, if it's 70-30, is it 60-40, you know, especially demographics to see, is there enough of that genre that of those individuals who are going to be watching that film? Wilson Morales, blackfilm.com. I'm going to see you at the New York Film Festival, buddy. All right. All right. See you. Thanks a lot for being on the podcast. All right. Take care. It's time for Jack Dick. Let's begin with the top movie news of the week. There will be a new Terminator movie, and this time Linda Hamilton from the original is set to return, reuniting with James Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger for a planned trilogy. Superman the movie The Extended Cut is coming to Blu-ray. Wonder Woman's Gal Gadot is in early talks to join Bradley Cooper in a brand new film. The U.S. Latino film Lowriders is now out on Blu-ray, and check out the new Lara Croft movie trailer on our website at showbizcafe.com. In TV news, Hulu's Handmaid Tale wins Best Drama Series at the Emmys, while HBO's Veep wins Best Comedy. Speaking of Emmys, ratings are in and they hit a second worst all-time low. Billy on the Street is leaving True TV after two years. E ends Mariah Carey docuseries. HBO has renewed the porno drama The Deuce for a second season. The Daily Mail and Page Six now have TV shows to take on TMZ TV. Lady Gaga's documentary is now on Netflix. Jordan Peele is developing a Nazi hunting TV drama and HBO moves forward with a superhero Watchmen series. Switching over to music, the Latin Grammy Awards postponed their nominations announcement due to natural catastrophes in Latina locations. Telemundo did announce their Latin American Music Award nominations, and Colombia Shakir and Maluma lead all nominees with eight and nine nods apiece. Luis Fonson and Romeo Santos garnered five each, and crossover artists Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, and The Weeknd were also nominated. And Janet Jackson was caught on video dancing in concert to Dominican rapper Cardi B. And in digital and social media news, Shonda Rhimes is partnering with Hearst Magazine to launch a digital publishing platform called Shondaland.com. YouTube enlists Craig Ferguson to host the show. Google has bought part of HTC and is planning to get into the phone game again. Instagram adds face filters to live video. BuzzFeed News is premiering a brand new live stream morning show on Twitter called AM to DM on September 25th from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. It's being described as Good Morning America for millennials. And when you can, update your iPhone. iOS 11 is already available. 90% of the immigrant community that we work with is undocumented. Almost 100% are below the poverty level. In many communities, they're invisible. There's a new HBO documentary called Clinica de Migrantes that airs September 25th, and it's about undocumented immigrants who have trouble accessing medical insurance. What is most curious, though, is that this film was directed by Max Pozdorovkin, a Russian-American. What compelled a Russian to film this Latino documentary? 
We ask him now on the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. This is an HBO documentary that is airing Monday, September 25th here in the United States. A perfect time during the Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, HBO is known as a company that creates quality content. And whenever they put something out, it's basically some sort of news or event. It's something that has to be watched. Give us an overview of what this documentary is about and its significance. Well, the film follows a year in the life of Puentes de Salud, which is a, a volunteer-run clinic in Philadelphia that's involved in the highly politically sort of dangerous activity of giving medical treatment to undocumented immigrants in Philly. So the, you know, so the patient pool of the clinic is... Um, landscapers, busboys at restaurants, housekeepers, that kind of population, mostly Latino, uh, mostly from Central America, a lot of people from Mexico, from Honduras, from Guatemala. Um, and the clinic is run by this doctor named Stephen Larson and another doctor named Jack Ludmere, and they volunteer their time and they work with med students as well as other, as, as well as undocumented people from the community. And they've over seven or eight years, they built up this real place of refuge for undocumented people. And so the film is really about the building of the clinic and sort of their struggle to keep it afloat. Now, how did you get involved into this? Because, and, you know, hopefully you don't mind me saying this, but most immigrant stories are really left to Latino who have somehow experienced these uh, issues. For you to be involved, are you somehow Latino? Do you have Latino friends? I'm just trying to find the link here between you and this uh, this great documentary that you've done. It seems like it's more of a passion than anything else. Well, I mean, I'm an, I'm an immigrant. I grew up in Russia and moved here. So for me, immigrant issues and sort of immigrant experience has always been something that I've been fascinated with. Uh, I, I read a, a small article about uh, Puentes de Salud, and I sort of just became fascinated by the intersection of, but, but by the way that the intersection of healthcare and uh, and immigrant rights, that that intersection told you so much about this bizarre status that undocumented people occupy in this country in a way that they're present, they're everywhere, they're working at every at most restaurants that you're going to. They're working for Walmart. They're working for all these places. But then a lot of the even very basic social benefits they can't get. So read this article and went to the clinic just to check it out. And I was so humbled and sort of inspired by the work that the people there were doing mm-hmm. that I, I really wanted to tell the story. And I had done a few films with HBO, so I, you know, so we decided to do this together. How did HBO receive the pitch that you wanted to do? It doesn't seem something that HBO does quite often. I thought I think that they saw once we had shot a little bit. I think they saw that it was a really kind of important and moving and inspiring story, and so I think they they trusted us to go along making it. The documentary is about 40 minutes long. Um, Explain to me why it's 40, the duration, and not 90 or two hours. I think that initially my idea was to make a film that was largely, I think I had seen, as you mentioned, I had seen a lot of stories that were the stories of immigrants coming across America, making that journey through the desert, uh, and then finding their place. And what I wanted, I wanted to limit this film to the perspective of the doctor's who have, who sort of, who take an oath, who have a responsibility to treat people, and the way that they're often structurally prevented by the medical system as it exists mm-hmm. from treating, you know, from treating people, and often it's done in a way that's economically irrational because a lot of times having people come to the emergency room comes, it becomes much, is much more expensive for these hospitals than offering preventative care. So. Um, so I think that that paradox f- felt really productive for a movie, so or that intersection rather, that nexus of immigration and healthcare. So we just started exploring it, and you know, and at the beginning when we set out to make the movie, I didn't think that we would be get consent from any of the patients to be in the movie because why in your why would anyone in their right mind agree to be to have their doctor's visit filmed, and so. So we started filming and we weren't really sure how it would go. So, but then to our surprise, almost every patient agreed to be in the film. Why do you and think that was? Because they're so grateful 
for a fact that this place exists and they're so you know systemically deprived mm. of any kind of basic oh, sort of the, to them the fact that this place exists is really so special that they wanted to do anything they could to help we agreed with them that you know no one would be identified by name in the film but uh that's what i think that the film was a real gift is that we kind of get these very intimate this very intimate access to seeing these interactions and really kind of get this perspective on but what it's like to live as an undocumented person in, a, in, a, in an American city. So one of the things that I feel that film does is it really uh, allows the person that is a non-believer or a skeptic or a cynic in any way to probably persuade them to think differently. Um, has this documentary, before its release on HBO, has it been, be seen, has it been seen by any politicians, by any... Uh, people of influence that can make some sort of change. What kind of feedback have you heard pre the airing on HBO? Well, I think that every a lot of people who have seen it and it's played in various it played at the at, at the Nalev uh, Latin Producers uh, Summit in LA, I think a month ago, and then it's traveled festivals and it's won some awards at festivals. And I think that everyone that's involved in this is incredibly grateful to, to have the film be there. At the same time, in terms of Washington, in terms of politicians, there isn't really a lobby for undocumented immigrant rights. You know, there's a, there's, there. Nobody so gives a, lot, a shit, Max. Nobody gives a shit, and it's a really, and that's why I wanted to make the, you know, to make the film about him and give it, give it a sort of platform. Yes, yeah, so, because it's really hard, but I think that when people are moved by the stories, mm -hmm. and they realize, for me, the most important thing is, look, every time we go to a restaurant, you know, your bill is $20, $25 cheaper because of the people who are working in the kitchen. Right. Same thing when you go to Walmart and all these things. And so if you recognize that you're a di direct beneficiary of this labor by sa because you save money from it, then I think that there's a sense of responsibility that comes along with that. And that's something that we're often very blind to and myopic to. So the current law right now doesn't allow immigrants. And let me see if I can understand sort of the premise of, of the documentary. A lot of the laws currently in the United States do not allow uh, undocumented immigrants, which is about 11 million, yep. to get proper health insurance. And so there's these clinics like Puentes de Salud that uh, take care of about 10,000 patients. <laughs> That's yep. nothing compared to the amount of immigrants that are out there. Um Obviously, the challenges are overwhelming. Uh, the solutions aren't easy. But if someone had to take away something from this documentary, outside of the reality of what's going on, what would that be, Max? Well, I want people to be inspired by the work that the clinic does because it's a, it's a true kind of grassroots organization that's grown from a church basement into like a holistic wellness center for the community. Mm -hmm. And the idea that this can be done and you can kind of work parallel to the system and you can, you know, the people and the volunteers, they don't give up. They just kind of continue doing the work that they do, even when there's pressure not to do it, even when there's no money for it. And so for me, it's, it's, it's sort of an inspiring story about American heroes. And that's what I want people to take away. And I think that also, you know, film is an empathy machine. And I think that in, in that regard, this film kind of gives gives access to a certain le a certain kind of immigrant experience that I want more people to see and I want it to be more represented so that's why sort of there needs to be some sort of unionization yep of these waiters or these workers to be able to get paid at least a decent wage and be able to then afford insurance right but that doesn't seem well, to no, be changing well no but they can't buy insurance too. you know one of the things is that they're structurally prohibited from buying insurance. oh so even if they had the money they still can't yeah, do even it even if you have the money undocumented immigrants can't buy insurance and so and that makes easily conditions such as high blood pressure diabetes that are very easily manageable uh, it makes it basically impossible for these people to to get treatment for it unless they're plugged into a system unless they can get on the uh, and unless they can get medicine through Walmart, but a lot of times they just don't know how to go, f do, how to access those resources. And so I think that one of the things that the clinic does in the film is really point a lot of the undocumented community towards the resources that they can have, even though they're prohibited from buying health insurance or get being treated in 
in hospitals. You know, and the worst thing about this is that we're now officially going through this DACA issue. You know, it's been yep. the talk of the week for the last week. When you heard about DACA, what were your initial thoughts as you had already finished this documentary? Oh, you know, because so many of the patients in the film are DACA kids, and they're sort of some of the most, they 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 embody the best parts of the immigrant spirit for me. And so it was, of course, it was tragic. I mean, it's a tragic decision. And what I thought about most was this issue of the shifting sands of consent, mm -hmm. that when, when a lot of the people gave permission to be in the movie, they, I mean, they did so anonymously, but it was at a time when the immigration services were not actively seeking out undocumented people unless they were involved in the criminal justice system. Right. Now, once that changes, what happens to the consent that's given? Because obviously we're putting out a movie into the world. It's very clear from the movie that most of the patients who appear in it are undocumented. It's sort of a premise. And they're mostly Central American, right? Not Mexican. They're mostly Central American. Yeah, and so what happens to that consent? And in a way, I became extremely nervous because I'm sort of worried to put these people in greater risk. And But then at the same time, you don't want to heed that concern you don't want to acquiesce because to the powers that be because then you're, it's you're it's just cowardice hey um one last question i wanted to ask you max um mm -hmm. in russia what's the medical environment like you know if you're an immigrant and you go to russia i'm not sure if you know this or not but it, it, yeah. is it like no, the U is it like the united states that you can't get a, 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 any medical attention if you're sick with the flu or anything like that in russia it's, what happened is you had a state kind of a state-run medical system, which was fairly, I mean, fair, was pretty good during the Soviet times. And then it's been sort of systemically, systematically destroyed during, during the 90s and the 2000s. So now there's a sort of two-tier system, a sort of a more public medical system and a, high, and a large privatized sector. Mm -hmm. So doctors who will only work for money and don't work sort of for a hospital. So there's a certain kind of two-tier system, but immigrants can buy into, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they can buy into insurance or pay out of pocket. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So, but I mean, but, 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 but the basic class issues are sort of the same, you know, across, because ultimately it's a, you know, it's a, it's a here it's, it's, it's doubly hard because they're just systemically prohibited from buying insurance, but it's, uh, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's also a class issue, and there's lots of poor, poor Americans who don't have access to health care. And you thought that Obamacare would have actually solved some of those issues, but it, it didn't. It, it needed, like, another Democrat to come in and sort of... Um, yeah, to push single payer through. Right exactly, now. exactly. Oh, well. Max Pozdorovkin, director of the new HBO documentary Clinica de Migrantes. It airs Monday, September 25th, and you can catch it on HBO. We'd rather not even embrace that they're human. Once you open the door and admit that they're real, they're live, they're part of my community, it's like driving by a car accident. You're either going to stop and help or you're not. Hey, before we talk to Deborah Castillero about her new Latino app for children, last week I handed off our music discovery segment to music connoisseur Diego del Sol. This week I invited my good friend Yako, radio personality from Miami's 94.9 2FM, iHeartRadio, and he shares his personal and unique music selections with all of us. Hope you like it. Thank you very much. Hey guys, it's uh, Larry here, Yako, known in the radio industry. Been doing radio for a little bit, around 20 years. I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I really, really enjoy every type of music, every type of genre out there. But I'm going to give you three of my suggestions that you should include in your playlist right now. Of course, in the genre of electronic, a little bit of reggaeton. And of course, if you're into the positive hits, I got a perfect selection for you. Okay, so here we go. Let's start with the electronic vibe. I'm into the deep house and one of my favorite DJs, very inspired by him, very inspired by his producing skills. His uh, drops are unique. His bass, his production is very unique. His vocals, I'm talking about Cascade. And um, this song is called Play With Me from his extended play album. It's called Rita. So here it is. So you want to play, step right up. So you want to play with me. So you want to play, try your luck. So you want to play, well come play with me. 
Let's get into a little bit of reggaeton. Gotta love a little bit of John Del. His reunion with his uh, old colleague we seen makes the song very, very hot right now. It's going back to the roots of reggaeton. It's called Como Antes. This one you should be banging on your playlist right now. like the positive hits music like I do, if you like the worship music, if you like the, if you're a Jesus fanatic, of course, you got to include in your playlist a little bit of Hillsong United. His the brand new album, Wonder, is bananas. It's very good. So uh, Future Marches In is one of my favorites that I have on my playlist. You should include it too. Hope you really enjoyed the tracks. If you want to check out some more cool tracks, you should head over to showbizcafe.com. You can search me on my social media at Yako Radio, at Y-A-K-O Radio. On Instagram, tag me on your photo. I'll like it. We'll be in contact there. Thank you, Jack Rico, for having me on your show. Yako, you killed it, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing some of your favorite music with us. In the meantime, what was the last time you used the Latino app? You rarely hear about them, right? Well, Deborah Castillero, a Latina entrepreneur, has launched one. It's a multicultural app that teaches children to speak English and Spanish. How does she do it? How was it funded? And is it a replacement for school? Deborah joins me now on the podcast to answer all of these questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Rico. <laughs> you know I'm a big fan, and congratulations on the amazing work you're doing. Well, thank you so much. You and I know each other for so, quite some time. We've met uh, through uh, the media industry. The last time I think I saw you was in a channel called Veme, which I think still exists, right? It absolutely does. What you are what you decided to do is, explain to me how you ended up coming to the point where now you are creating a, and let me see if I can get this right, you're creating a new app for, for, for children to learn English and Spanish, and it's called, the app is called Care Bears and Amigos, correct? That's right. And what I learned in doing that research is that English language learners are growing seven times faster than the general student population. And get this, Jack, by 2025, 25% of all kids in the United States will be an English language learner. So what yes. does that ultimately mean? What that means is it, for schools at present time with only 11% of, of teachers are actually bilingual, that this is a huge pain point for schools, that they have all these English language students in the classroom and they don't have adequate resources uh, to support the acceleration of their second language learning. And so when, when I realized that this problem existed and it's continuing to grow. A little light bulb went off in my head because as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, as someone who's come into corporate America and presented, presented innovative ideas to tap into a viable market, mm -hmm. it really spoke to me personally because I am the daughter of an immigrant. My mom is from Panama. I 
through financial need, like a lot of immigrant parents, they send their kids back to the homeland to spend the summers with their grandmothers. And I had that experience. I got thrusted into, at seven years old, sent to Panama for three months and didn't speak a word of Spanish. So I know what it's like personally to be in an environment where everyone else is speaking a second language and you don't understand it. And I thought, in looking at the landscape in Silicon Valley, and I will make some generalizations here, that a lot of the developers are not people of color. They definitely are not Hispanic. There aren't a lot of women in tech. I thought to myself, if someone from our community doesn't step in to solve this problem, who's gonna do it? Like, who is gonna care more than Latinos care about our own community. And so that really was the impetus that kind of jump-started my, my vision of creating resources for this subset of the population, recognizing that it's continuing to grow. You know, it's interesting because I thought this whole thing came out because maybe you and uh, your son uh, had language difficulties and you said, you know what? This is such a personal issue, such a passionate issue to me. I'm going to create an app. But no, this, this is really something that, that's, that's come through since you were in Panama all the way to now through that's correct. passages through the industry. And yeah. so let's talk a little bit about the app then. So um, Care Bears and Amigos. First of all, I know Care Bears because I used to watch Care Bears when I was a kid. I think yeah. every kid watched Care Bears. How did your company um, partner up with Care Bears to create mm -hmm. this app? Yes. Well, entrepreneurs have to be very scrappy, mm -hmm. right? Because we have limited resources. And what I frequently do as a little hack is I go, I, I will sign up as a volunteer to attend conferences. So I was living in San Francisco. There was a children's media conference that I really wanted to attend. And so I signed up as a volunteer. And while I was there, I met one of the VPs from American Greetings Entertainment. And there's the card company, and then there's the entertainment division, and the entertainment division's flagship IP is Care Bears. Mm -hmm. I met this wonderful woman. We had an initial conversation, then we had a follow-up conversation. Networking. It, it seems yes. like it, 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 guys <laughs> and ladies, if you want to go get a job, you need to network. You need to be at conferences. You need to be at networking circles. You need to go out to uh, a couple of lunches and breakfasts. It's the only way that things are going to get done is when you meet people and you talk and you brainstorm. And right? being at those conferences that can be very pricey, the influencers and the leadership is there. Those conferences are really critical. Hmm. Lo you know, a few months later, I sat with her and the president of American Greetings Entertainment. And basically what they communicated to me was that they were really, they, they genuinely believe that there's huge potentiality in creating a business uh, platform that is focused on English language learning, not just in the United States, but outside of the United States. And they're also seeing demographic shifts in the marketplace and wanting to expose care bearers to another subset of the population b being Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And so their approach to me was, look, you're the expert, you know this space, let's do a deal. So that's how this whole Care Bears and Amigos came to fruition. I right. was able to, so with that content licensing deal, I was able to raise a little bit of money. How did you raise the money? Oh, <laughs> that that's the tricky part, right? Um, and I, I do want to preface before I get into that by saying that for all of you who may be entrepreneurial, do recognize that raising money today and age is extremely difficult and investors are very much risk adverse and they really want to see so much traction before they put a dollar into your company. And the second thing I'd like to mention is that only 7% of all startup money funding goes mm -hmm. to fe female founders. Only 7%. Only 7 yeah, blow your mind with one other stat. Less than 1% goes to people of color. Get out of here. Oh, my God. See, the, the, oh, my God. There's so many changes that need to happen. I mean, you know, America isn't really the dream concept 
that was sold to us <laughs> a mm. long time ago. And uh, obviously it's evident by these stats. Um, so it's really up to us to kind of take a foot one by one and build something on our own. Because that's the one thing that America does provide that other countries don't is, is the ability to, if you have your own dream, you can achieve it. It's not going to be easy, but it can happen. So how did you end up finding the money to create? Because I get, I'm, I'm sure that creating an app isn't cheap. Oh, no, this is a hundred thousand dollar investment. Holy smokes. Yeah. Okay. So, and so how long did it take you to, to raise that money? Um, it took me, it was a combination of multiple conversations over a year. And so there is a small group of Latino investors out of Silicon Valley, Leap, Look at Glo that. Leap Global Innovation. There was an early believer and supporter there. His name is Roman Leal, to whom I'm extremely grateful for the seed money. And so with that money, we I hired a dev team, Boktoon Labs, out of Merida, Mexico, to work Good with for me. you, Deborah. Yeah. You go, girl, man. <laughs> a hustler, man. I love this. I love Thank the story. Thank you. And so just, you know, I put my nose down to the grindstone with my team. Now, let me, I do want to just say this isn't all about Deborah Castillero. There are, were some amazing people that, you know, have rallied behind me to support me. So I worked with my educators, those that have doctorates and master's degrees in bilingual and dual language education mm -hmm. to work on the framework for four months. And then uh, we worked with the dev team diligently for eight months. And I have, you know, some amazing news to share with you kind of, uh, fresh, you know, um, incredible information. And that is that <laughs> this past weekend, our little app, Care Bears and Amigos, not only got featured on the kids section of um, the app store, but Apple placed it on their front page. So we got oh a Oh my God, this is great news. Feature. <laughs> and we are not, we were positioned right underneath the FEMA and the Red Cross app because, you know, we just, this Irma just plowed through Florida. And so those were the, the apps at the top of the page and directly below it is Care Bears and Amigos. So I am extremely grateful to the Apple folks for their endorsement. And we did like 25,000 downloads this past weekend. I was just going to say that must have helped tremendously. Yes, I'm thrilled and I just need to keep the momentum going and um I, you know I'm still actively looking for investors to support my marketing efforts. Why should people go to the App Store and download this? Their kids are already going to school. Uh yeah. why do they need this app? There really are no apps at present time like this. So what's different about Care Bears and Amigos is it follows the if there were a common core curriculum for preschoolers and kindergarten, we are following that. So there's there's early STEM through the zoo. There's early geometry at the Statue of Liberty. There's early numeracy, how to tell time, what is more and what is less when they ride the subway. When they visit Washington Heights, they learn about phonics and letter recognition, and, um, and it's a celebration of Latino culture. When they um, go to care a lot, they learn about social and emotional learning, which the care bears are experts in that space. And then mm -hmm. there's a beautiful uh, ebook that s establishes why Tippy Tom are in New York City helping the care bears. There's an, a storyline that celebrates the immigrant experience, which is very much in opposition to the rhetoric we are hearing coming from Washington. And so it is, it, there is there, it is interactive, it is kid friendly, it is multicultural with really solid instruction, all in two languages that build literacy and, um, and a lot of learning. So there's, over 1,500 words, so building a child's vocabulary at, in those early years is really critical. And, you know, a, a dear friend of mine who's an Emmy award-winning story editor, 
Her name is Jill Haza Turner, and she's won her Emmys for Word World and the Chicka Club and um, Chicka Chicka and uh, <laughs> Baby Einstein. I mean, she's phenomenal. And, what, and she lives in Westchester, New York. And she said to me, what I love about this app, Deborah, is that you are going to give my kids an opportunity to go to Washington Heights, a neighborhood that I probably will never visit because I don't have any friends there. And she loves like the she whole She could always culture. take a tour, you know, a guided of tour. Course, <laughs> I mean, but come you, on. <laughs> you know, you get her point, right? And and the whole app takes place in New York City. So kid, kids and families all over the world have heard about New York City. But if you live outside of New York City, the likelihood of you coming to New York is very low. So we're giving kids an opportunity to see the Statue of Liberty, right? To ride a New York City subway and to, you know, so there's a there's a lot of magic to it. And and like I said, the pedagogy is really solid. And it's a, I'm very, very proud of the work that my team, um, that all of us collectively have built this really beautiful, amazing app. So now, that's the reason why they should go and download it off the absolutely. app. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like a like a great concept. Uh, I'm not a father, but I can definitely see the importance and significance of uh, learning a second language, especially at that age, which is where we are most impressionable. But this isn't trying to replace school, is it? Is this a complement to school? No, it isn't. So here, here's the issue with regard to the problem that we're trying to solve. Only 50% of Hispanic kids actually attend preschool. And that is because of uh, poverty or is that because uh, there's nobody to take them? I mean, what exactly is the core root issue of why there's a couple, that amount of kids yeah. aren't, aren't going to school? Right. Uh, sometimes it's about access getting to the preschool and that can mean that there isn't a preschool in their in their neighborhood and that means that it could mean that they don't have money to get their kids to the preschool uh there's also the culture piece of wanting to keep their kids home with los abuelos does this app is this app supposed to kind of fill in the gap momentarily until they go to school what we're doing is we're building vocabulary, right? And that's a huge issue. So there's a couple of things. In two languages, that, English. In and two Spanish. languages, because you want to utilize your heritage language. It, if you, in having a solid base in your heritage language, you you can make the transference to a second language more easily. But what we're finding in certain subset of our culture, of our community, of the Hispanic culture is you have parents that have maybe a sixth grade education. You, there are no books in the house and the child is not attending preschool, but what does exist in the house are mobile devices. Right. So we can, and, and the beauty of this app is because it's in Spanish and English, there is a high probability of us also increasing parental engagement because a lot of parents will say, I can't participate in my child's education because I don't speak English. Well, here's an opportunity where we're giving them the content in Spanish so that they at a at a preschool level so that they can participate even if their own literacy literacy skills are low. So one of the reasons like for example, all around the United States, you're hearing mayors and de Blasio in the New York City area is big on universal pre-K. Why? Why are they pushing universal pre-K? Because statistically, we know that if a child is not performing at a certain level in math and reading by second grade, we already know that 50% of those kids will not graduate from high school. So those oh preschool God. years are incredibly important and most mayors understand that and so providing free universal pre-k uh, you know programs like head start right are also incredibly important and you know every year they're on the chopping block of not receiving federal funds so i am trying to use technology and mobile to get into those households but i also i want to just clarify that this app 
isn't just for the Latino community. It's for, there's a whole movement that's happening around the Mm -hmm. country that is coming from middle class educated families that are demanding, requesting and demanding that their local schools offer dual immersion or you know or an immersive experience in a second language. It's yeah, so don't interesting. tell Arizona that, you know, who wants to eliminate Mexican American studies from their classrooms. <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? You know, it, it, it's it's uh, it's interesting what you say because America internationally when you look when when Europeans or anybody else looks at America, they look at a at a country that is very monolingual, you know, and monoculture. Uh, they only want to speak English. They don't want to speak another language. Uh, they don't leave the country to really travel the world and have a different perspective. It's all very insular. They, they, live, they live in a bubble. And it's a very echo chamber sort of effect. So the importance of knowing a second language to you, because, you know, this isn't an app that's just one language or another language. You have both languages. Why do you think learning a second language is so important? Well, all the science indicates... Um, that it helps with cognitive development. It um, it stimulates the frontal lobe, right? That increases your metalinguistic skills. I mean, there's just so much science that to demonstrate the cognitive advancements that, of being bilingual. And one of your recent podcast participants, Simon Romero from the New York Times. That's right. He, he, t- he talked extensively about the benefits of being bilingual and how Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world. There's also research to demonstrate that being bilingual reduces the incidence of Alzheimer's. But equally important is we're living in a global economy, right? Mm-hmm. And so kids in China are learning English in first grade and Chinese being the, true. The, the, the- International the, schools. Correct. International schools. They have them in Latin America, uh, where Spanish kids, well, you know, if, if, if they're wealthy enough, can afford these international schools, then they start learning English. And so by the time they're teenagers and adults, they can travel to Miami or New York or anywhere and, uh, and actually do business, which is amazing. Absolutely. So I can definitely see how this, this works. Now, is there a price point for this app or yes. is it free? It's it's called it's a freemium model, a term that you know was developed out of Silicon Valley, and what that means is that you can download the app for free. You will have access to the zoo and to the uh, Statue of Liberty and the ebook. But if you want access to all five worlds, it's a tier system, right? It's four ninety nine, and I just oh, that's to- not that bad no. for the ability to learn yes. a whole other language in a very creative way, in a very innovative way, and uh, with the Care Bears also sort of like reputation and branding behind it, uh, no. which seems like really cool. And it's now in the App Store. Is there what happens if you don't have iTunes or an iPhone? Uh, right. Can you get you this can, on Android? You absolutely can go to Google Play and download it for oh, um, great. all Android phones as well. And and, um, you know, I just, I want to encourage your audience to support an entrepreneur, right? Because if I can't generate Especially revenue, a female entrepreneur. Yes, if I can't <laughs> generate revenue, if you don't hit the buy button, then Deborah is, and her company is going to have to go bye bye. So no, well, we don't want that to happen. You know, uh, hopefully our listeners who are parents, uh, or who know parents and want to give them a gift because that, because you could probably do a gift too, right? I think you can do that. Well, Deborah, listen, uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast and telling us about uh, Care Bears and Amigos, the app. It's currently uh, featured on the iTunes App Store. Congratulations on that. I think this is an amazing thing that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we want to be able to support you uh, doing this. I think we need more apps like this and more people like you who want to change the world and beginning with our children. So, Deborah, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí en el Highly Relevant Podcast. Gracias a ti, Jack. Un placer. That's it for episode 50 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I'd like to thank Wilson Morales, Deborah Castillero, and Max Pozdorovkin for being on the show. And thank you guys for taking the time out to listen from your favorite streaming platform wherever you may be. 
If you like this US Latino podcast, please share it on your social media apps, tell your friends all about it. And if you can, have them subscribe to the show. If you'd like to reach out to us, email us at highlyrelevant at showbizcafe.com. That's highlyrelevant at showbizcafe.com. Sending our prayers and safe wishes to our Latino friends in Mexico and Puerto Rico. See you next week on another episode of Time. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.